Hi, this next project is a multi-ROM cartridge for the Atari 5200. Uh, you can see my Atari 5200 over here on this side. Uh, this is a console from the early 80s, maybe 1982 or so. This uh, succeeded the um, very popular Atari 2600. Um, uses plug-in cartridges, you know, of the usual sort. Um, has this controller here. Controllers kind of have a reputation for not being very good because they don't auto center. So rather than acquiring all 80 to 100 cartridges that you can get for this thing, I decided to build myself a multi-ROM cartridge. Uh, you can see the multi-ROM cartridge over here. Um, other people have built multi-ROM cartridges. Uh, you can actually find some of them for sale commercially. Um, I've never owned a, another version of a multi-ROM cartridge. This is my first one, this one that I designed and built myself. Um, this one uses a Raspberry Pi to load the cartridge image. Uh, you can see the Raspberry Pi Zero W stuck on the back. Um, kind of couldn't fit it all inside the case, so I had to hack out the back of the case a little and hack out the front of the case a little to accommodate the parts. And the way this works is this large IC that you can see sticking through the front of the cartridge is a dual port RAM. Um, a dual port RAM is a RAM chip that can be used by two different uh, CPUs at the same time. Uh, so one CPU that's interfaced to the dual port RAM is the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero W, and the other CPU that's interfaced to it will be the Atari 5200. So certainly the Pi Zero W, a uh, lot of computing power there compared to um, an old Atari. Uh, the Zero W could actually uh, emulate the Atari completely, you wouldn't even need a game system, but it's fun to play it on the actual hardware. So. Our fancy multi-ROM cartridge is going to be built using modern hardware, but only uh, so much as to actually load a cartridge ROM image into that shared memory. And then uh, once it's loaded into the memory, we're completely playing everything on the actual Atari 5200. Usually my videos, I start out with the design, um, and then I show the, the building of it, and then I finally um, do a demo. Uh, this time I'm going to kind of flip the order, I'm going to do the demo first. Let's uh, plug the cartridge in. Now we'll turn on the uh, game console. Uh, you'll either get a black screen or you'll get you know, some error bars or something on the game console since it has no uh, ROM image loaded. Um, right now we've got the blank screen. So if we, if we take my iPhone out, um, I wrote this app on the Raspberry Pi using just a standard web page. So here it is on the iPhone. I don't know uh, how easy it is to see it. Hopefully you can read it, but there's a drop down. Take the drop down. We can select um, Asteroids. And there it has loaded Asteroids onto the Atari 5200. And uh, then we can hit our start button. And you know, Asteroids is playing. I think the Asteroids release for the Atari 5200 was kind of crappy. Let's try another game. Um, let's try uh, Berserk. So you can see it's loading the image and then it's actually resetting the CPU to uh, use the new image. Um, so here, playing Berserk. Whoops. Oh, too bad. Ooh, we escaped. Um, let's try another image. Um, where's something interesting? Uh, Buck Rogers. So there, we've loaded Buck Rogers. Planet of Zoom. Yeah, so there's Buck Rogers. Um, where's Pac-Man? Pac-Man.
oh look at that it kind of crashed um, well there is a reset button let's see if it loads properly after reset there we go that time it worked um, something must still be a look so there's Pac-Man let's try something else um, how about Vanguard there's Vanguard Oops. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of what the uh, cartridge does. As I said, there are other cartridges out there that do similar things. Um, I think mine may be unique in that I'm using Raspberry Pi and I can select the image from the iPhone. Um, and I can automatically reboot the 5200 when a new cartridge image takes effect. Uh, now let's look at the design a little bit. One side. We've got Atari 5200. The other side we've got a Pi Zero W. And in the middle, we'll put dual ported memory 32K. Uh, now to access this dual ported memory from the Atari 5200 is pretty simple. We've got address bus we've got chip select and then back it's going to be the data bus uh, that's just a simple standard uh, memory addressing um, from the 0W it's going to be a little more complicated um, we still have an address bus We still have a chip select. We also have a read, write, um, and then we've got data bus. The problem is that the data bus on the Raspberry Pi 3.3 volt over here it's 5 volt. So in the middle we need to put a FET bus switch to handle the level conversion between the 3.3 volt logic of the Pi Zero W 5 volt logic of the dual ported memory. So the Raspberry Pi uh, Zero W it could send the data just fine without the FET bus switch but if we ever wanted to read the data um, we would have the problem because the 5 volt logic over here could put about a 4.5 volt uh, high level out and that 4.5 volt high level would fry our Raspberry Pi. Uh, so the FET bus switch is necessary to do that level transition. Okay, so here's the schematic. Uh, the schematic is similar to the block diagram. Uh, we've got a dual ported memory. The dual ported memory has a left side and a right side. The left side of the dual ported memory, its address bus goes over here to the Atari 5200, its data bus goes to the Atari 5200, its chip select line, this one here, uh, goes through a couple gates. We need to combine uh, the 5200's um, upper chip select and lower chip select. Uh, we, could use, we could do that with a uh, AND gate or we could do it with two NAND gates, so I chose to do it with two NAND gates. So we also NAND in the 5 volt signal from the 5200 on the cartridge connector and that's just to ensure that we're not putting out um, any chip selects and we're not sending out any data until the uh, 5200 has actually been powered up. So I had a little bit of concerns about you know what would happen if we actually sent out power through this data bus and we actually ended up powering the 5200 through the data bus. You know, could we fry something that's 
this here is to protect against that. Um, on the Raspberry Pi uh, side of things, uh, we've got you know the right side bus. Um, many of these lines go directly to the Raspberry Pi. The Pi is down here. Um, so, for example, your um, chip select, your read, write, um, stuff like that goes directly in. Um, we do have the FET bus switch down here, and the FET bus switch takes all eight data lines, uh, puts them through the bus switch, and then connects them to the Pi. Uh, so that is to do the 3.3 um, volt to 5 volt level transition. So over here, the address bus needs a little additional explanation, so I ran out of pins on the Raspberry Pi, so I was able to wire the nine lower bits of the address bus directly to the Pi, uh, but the six upper bits of the address bus I had to put through um, this PCF8574 I.O. expander. So these I.O. expanders, they're a way for you to get additional I.O.s on your microcontroller the interface via I2C, and they give you eight more pins. So I took six of those address lines, put them over here on the uh, 8574. So for the two remaining um, IOs on the 8574, I hooked one of them to the interlock pin. So the interlock is these two pins over here that tell the 5200 that a cartridge has been inserted. Uh, so by monitoring um, the interlock in, we can tell that the uh, 5200 is powered up. And then by sending a signal out the interlock out, uh, we can tell the 5200 uh, that we're ready to start executing the cartridge. And that is our way to force a reset of the 5200. So you can see this um, iLock control goes over here to a transistor. Transistor is used to pull down that interlock out. So unfortunately we can't use the power from the Atari 5200 connector, that standard 5 volts there, because we want to be able to reset it. To reset it we have to pulse the interlock pin and pulsing the interlock pin will shut down that power. So if we tried to reset it, we would shut ourselves off. That wouldn't be any good at all. So what I ended up doing was I put a couple headers out, voltage selection header here. In one position, you'll get um, external power through the barrel jacks. The other position, you will get power uh, from the console. Console, you can either get it from pin 11 or 26. Um, if you chose pin 11, you really don't want to do that because that would um, fry things because there's about 12 volts there. Um, so in this case, um, the way I'm doing the prototype now, you're always going to be choosing the external, that jumper, and you're always going to be putting your power in through the barrel jack. Um, the next revision of the board I'm going to add a voltage regulator so that we can use that power from um, the console. So here is the cartridge. Let me uh, take it apart. First we have to unplug the Pi from the back. And we'll just separate the two halves of the shell. It's always kind of tricky getting these separated without damaging anything. Okay, there, I've got the back half of the shell off. So that's the back half of the board. We can pull the board out. And there's the front half of the board. So let me plug the uh, Raspberry Pi back in. And there it is completed. So here from the front, from the front, you can see here is um, the dual-ported RAM chip. Um, these chips, this is an IDT7007. Uh, you can buy them from eBay. I think they're used ones for about 12 to 15 bucks. Uh, that's where I got mine from. You can buy a brand new one from Mauser Electronics for $47. Um, no surprise, I chose to go the eBay route. The dual-ported RAM chip is a PLCC68. Um, this is mounted in a socket. You can see the through-hole pins in the socket going out the back. Um, over here is the I.O. expander, the PCF8574. So over here is the DAN gate, the 74HCT00. And here is the FET bus switch. The FET bus switch, unfortunately, is surface mount. 
I guess whether you consider that unfortunate or not depends on whether you're good working with surface mount components or not. Um, I'm reasonably good with it. Um, hot air iron for putting them in. Um, other people may not be familiar. I try to do through hole in all my projects as much as I can, uh, but I couldn't find a FET bus switch that was through hole. So that one surface mount, you know, there's some uh, yellow bypass capacitors around. Um, transistor here for driving that interlock signal. Looking at the back, um, unplug the Pi so you can see the back. So there's these jumpers. I chose to put the jumpers out the back rather than the front just because there was room to squeeze them in and still get the back uh, case half to close over it. I ran my power jack out to this pigtail uh, just because if you mount the power jack on the board then it kind of stuck out too much and I had to cut a really big hole in the side of the uh, cartridge for it. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.